Pastor George quote, right, George? Pastor George in the back. Are we ready? Are we recording, Pastor George? Okay, so they got that on there. All right, all right. All right, we're continuing. We've been talking about inheritance. Somebody say inheritance, okay? Talking about legacy. And we've been talking about the multiplication on that legacy because if you get an inheritance and all you do is blow it on yourself, somebody say blow it, then what you've done is you've failed your children and your children's children because inheritance is meant to bless you, to advance you, and then it's meant to be multiplied by you that you would pass it on to your children and your children's children. Does that make sense? Okay. So in other words, a lot of times people get an inheritance, and let's say they got, you know, $100,000. That's a wonderful inheritance. But what they do is they say, well, I think God's telling me to pay off my house. So they pay off the whole house, and then they have nothing to show for it. And now they're building that inheritance, hopefully off of the mortgage payment they no longer have. And now they're building it on that, and they're building it from when you could really do something completely different with it, because how many of you know it's easier to make more money when you have more money? Come on. It's, it's hard to make money on a dollar, but I could, I could make more money on 50000 couldn't I? Roth IRAs, those kind of things, getting ready for that kind of thing. So we've been talking about it, multiplication of the legacy for the next generation and a generation after that. So what I want to talk to you tonight about is how to receive this inheritance. Amen. Listen, you're not here by accident, okay? You're here because God wants you to learn how to receive the inheritance, how to use the inheritance, and how to work it that it would multiply. Somebody say multiply. multiply. All right. How many of you know that God's uh, math is multiplication? It's not addition and subtraction. Yes. Come on. He says one defeats a thousand, two defeats 10,000, right? All right, so let's go on. Um, you remember the first, now, okay. What I started talking to you on legacy and on inheritance is we remember that the first way is by history. In fact, God made it so important, history, that he made times of remembrance in Israel's calendar, okay? Now, what's our calendar have? Easter, right? It's a time of remembrance. What's Easter supposed to be? Not the bunny, right? Resurrection. Okay, and Christmas, what's Christmas supposed to remind us of? The birth, okay? So God understands that in order to really inherit your inheritance, you must remember that it's there. Somebody say amen. amen. So in other words, you've got to remember that it's there. And what he did is he built it into Israel's calendar. Now, if you notice, most of the feast and most of the fast revolves around remembering the acts of God and the laws of God, okay? When you look at Israel. Now, what do I mean? Well, how many of you know that there is a Passover on Easter, okay? What is Passover? It's a feast that was put by God, it's in the scriptures, that was put by God for them to remember the time that the angel of death passed over their doors, killing the firstborn in Egypt. See, what he did is he says, you can't, you've got to remember this. And, and we've got to actually participate in that one times where the, what they do is they get um, a horseradish. They call it a bitter herb. And they get these crackers. And that's a funny story by itself. But you, you grab the horseradish and you purposely eat it. Okay. And it literally just burns your nose and they purposely do it. And the reason they do it, this was a Messianic congregation, is because they wanted to remember the bitterness of slavery. How many of you know that if God wants you to remember it, it might be important? So because of the nature of testimony, okay, remembering the past was meant to ignite a passion. Somebody say passion. Passion a passion in the heart of each generation, a passion to know the God of their forefathers, a passion to pursue the miracle signs and wonders. And I believe that's what's missing in our churches today, a passion for God. Somebody say passion again. Passion. I believe it's missing in churches today because of, uh, they have a passion for big ministries. They have a passion for big buildings. They have a passion for a mega this and a mega that. But the passion, I believe, is not missing at Living Word Church. Amen. Amen. 
I really believe that because I see, you know, when I see the videos that, that Irene will put on there of you guys throwing those flags, and when I come up here and say, let's worship him, you have no problem taking it to a whole other level. When, when Sister Monica or Sister Ariel starts to sing and take it to another level, you have no problem just, take, just following them in that level. Why? Because I believe Living Word has a passion. It's a passion for him. Why are you here tonight? You're not tired from Easter? Of course you are. Spurs are playing tonight and they're doing really good. Of course they are. But you're still here tonight. Why? Because there's something more important to you. Amen. There's something more important to you than even rest when you need it. How many of you are tired tonight? Come on, be real. But you're here tonight. Okay? There's something more important to you than just rest. There's something more important to you than the Spurs game or anything else. And I'm, listen, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm simply saying that you are here because you're passionate about God. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. I believe there's a lot of reasons why passion is not missing here at church. I believe your reason passion is not missing and your reason passion's not missing. Somebody raise your hand and say, I'm a reason that passion's not missing, okay? I believe the partners of Living Word Church are a reason that passion is not missing because quite honestly, uh, with a worship team, you don't have to follow the worship team if you don't want to, just like you don't have to say amen when I'm preaching if you don't want to, but something in you wants to be in the presence of God. And I believe that you're the reason why there's passion. But I also believe this. Listen very carefully. I believe there's passion at Living Word Church because of Testimony Thursdays. I believe there's passion because of that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that in a minute. Remember what I said just a few minutes ago. God actually added to the calendar of the Israelites... Because what he wanted them to do was remember, even the slavery, he wanted them to remember the day that the angel of death passed over the door. He wanted to remember the tenets that happened and all the things that happened. Now, I don't know if you know this, but testimony, the root word, do you know what it means? Do again. Do you know that? It means to do again. So every time, somebody say every time. Every time we repeat the story of God's invasion into human history, we're calling him to reveal himself as that same God again. In other words, God, you did it once, you'll do it again. And I believe that's part of the passion because how many of you are excited when you hear about somebody get a financial miracle? Why? Because you know that means he'll do it for you. You're excited because somebody speaks about a healing miracle. You're excited because someone speaks about a deliverance miracle. You, you're excited because an angel came into somebody's bedroom and, and visited them. You, you get this passion because we're remembering what God did. And we understand that a testimony means do it again. And we understand that do it again means he'll do it for me. Come on. That's what we start to understand. We're calling him to reveal himself as the same God, whether it be a deliverance, whether it be a, a financial a blessing, whether it be a healing. We're asking him to reveal himself as the same God today, right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. That's what we're doing when we testify. And I believe that's where we get the passion in this church. We expect to feel him when we come up here because people testify that when they walk in the back door, they feel him. Come on, is anybody here with me tonight? Yes. For this reason, we truly cannot receive... Oh. The passion comes because we're participating and we're testifying. Okay? Now listen to what I'm about to say. For this reason, we cannot truly receive our spiritual inheritance if all we do is applaud the accomplishments of God. Trust me, that will sink in. So many times, especially people that are not used to Testimony Thursdays, they don't understand what the whole gist is about. And they simply applaud when God does something, when they hear about what God does something, okay? They say, well, parting of the Red Sea, man, that's cool. Or, or manna every morning, that's pretty nice. Or he wipes out an entire army with one angel. Wow, that's awesome. And, and what they do is they applaud and they say, go Jesus. But what we should do is somehow apply that in our lives. Because if one angel can wipe out an army, what can that angel do when somebody's coming against you? See, testimony. 
Testimony brings a passion. Instead, maybe we should be going through something that we could testify like, you healed the sick, so I'm healed in the name of Jesus. You delivered the oppressed, so I am delivered from my enemies. You forgave everyone's sin, so I am forgiven. See, can you get passionate about that church? I'm telling you, what we have to do is not simply applaud. Listen, you know what I try to do is I try not to say, look at this story in the Old Testament. I say, look at the history in the Old Testament. There's a difference because when we hear story, we think of Noah and the flood as the, the little wooden boat with the, the giraffe sticking his head out and all these animals sticking their head out. And we think of this little children's story. But the truth was the ark was so so huge that it held all those animals and more. And there was no giraffe sticking their head out half the size of the ark. The giraffe looked like a, pen, like a toy in the light of the size of the ark. How many of you know our God is big? Amen. See, I think we shouldn't just applaud. I think we need to remember and call the testimony as our own. We cannot honor the memory of God's heroes by just remembering them. We honor them by imitating them. Did you hear what I said? See, we say, oh man, Moses was great, but how many of you think that we should act like Moses? We sit there and say, Esther was great, but how many of you think that we should act like Esther? See, what we have, what we have is to not only read about it and applaud about it and to memorize it, but to, if we testify about it and remember it, what we're doing is we're bringing that miracle and that do it again mentality into our today. Now, I ask you a question, church. How many people around us are just as slaves mentally? They're slaves to the world. The way they act, the way they talk, the way they respond, they're slaves to the world. And what happens is, church, is we're sitting there going, oh, God, would you come? Would you do something? He says, I did. I'm inside you. I'm inside you. What will you do? Will you testify to Moses, the great exodus? Will you testify to Esther, the one that gave Israel the ability to defend themselves? Will you testify about all the disciples or apostles or any? Will you testify and do more than just remember and applaud, but remember and apply? See, I think what was God saying earlier? He said, it's time, hush, baby, it's it, no more crying. Well, I think it's time for us to start uh, using our voice for something other than complaining. Come on. Amen. Using our voice for a prayer that isn't about what we don't have, but is in agreement for what we do have in Christ. See, I think that's where we need to go. I think when we come to know the God that they knew, when we call God and his kingdom into our day, into our time, into our circumstances, then we can expect him to do it again. Somebody say, do it again. Do it again. Listen, if you remember a scripture, that's not honoring what God did. Did you hear what I said? Just remembering a scripture is not honoring what God did. It is when you remember and apply it into your day, into your time, into your circumstance, into your situation. It's when you remember to apply it that finally you're honoring him. Look, I want to honor somebody right now. As I got this message today on Facebook. I want to read it to you so that anybody, maybe you're on the live stream, maybe YouTube, whatever it is, or maybe somebody here needs it. I don't know, but it was a, a, a miracle. It said, Brother Jesse, would you tell your church about a miracle? He said, I've been laid off since February 11th. Today is April 9th. I thought I was going to find a job quick. I was proud. These, past, these last past two weeks have re really drugged me down so much more. And this Easter Sunday, I re really wasn't even planning on going to church, but my mom asked if I would go with her. I did. And when I went to church, I cried. I gave everything I had to the Lord, all my hurt all my depression, all my love. And I heard him say this, all I wanted from you was this. So I sang and I praised him. The next morning, Monday morning, I got a call 
that a plumbing company named Bryant wants to hire me. That's a testimony. It's a testimony of a young man who hadn't been in church in a long time. It's a testimony of a young man who had been unemployed since February 19th. February, March, April, that's a good, almost a good two months. He, he calls himself proud. He calls himself as, I thought it was all taken care of, no big deal. He calls himself stepping into depression and even stepping, he calls all those things out. But when he came and gave it all to the Lord, the Lord blessed him. What do you bless him with? A job and a better job. Because what he did before, there was no union. Now he works for a plumbing company that's in the union. Somebody give God glory. When you honor God for what he's done, and I said honor, you receive that same spirit for what he can do with you. So let me ask you a question. Is anybody here, can you claim that God has healed your body? Anybody? He's touched you. He's healed you at one time or another. Okay. Can anybody claim that he has, uh, he's delivered you from demonic oppression? Anybody ever had any of that? Okay. All right. Can anybody uh, claim he saved you from hell? Everybody's answer be going up, right? Okay. So when we honor that, what do we honor? Well, you know what? Uh, you know, George, you had your hand up from demonic oppression, right? So I know that if I honor that testimony that he did it for George, he's going to do it for me. Why? Because George is not greater than me. I'm not greater than George. We're both sons of the Most High God. Amen? So when I testify, when he testifies, he's saying, God did it for me, and he's going to do it for you. And the same thing goes for healing. Why do I have to walk in sickness if God's healed somebody else? You ever wonder that? Why, why was he healing them, but he didn't heal me? Maybe you haven't grabbed hold of your inheritance. Maybe you haven't honored the testimony. Come on. You know how many people say, I want a financial miracle, but they won't pay their tithes. Come on. You got to honor the testimony. Here's this young man that sat there and said, I was, I was depressed. I was angry. I was all these different things. He says, but when I gave it over to him, he said, that's all I wanted. I wanted all your problems. And the very next day, he gets a phone call, and he said, it was all God. I believe it's so important, church, that we remember and we honor. If you study the Old Testament, look, we're going to start getting into revival here. This is very important. I believe that this church is getting ready to break out in revival. I really do. Don't look around the empty seats. Just look at that as opportunity. Amen? Opportunity for your families to step into the empty seats. Okay? Okay? Listen where we're going. Listen where we're going, church. Somebody say, I will, I will. Listen, listen to where we're going. In Jesus' name. When you study the Old Testament, you notice that when Israel failed to keep the law in their mouth, when they failed to remember the mighty acts of God, when they did this, they fell away. And as a result, their children and the grandchildren were not aware of the laws of God and were not aware of the acts of God. So the children and the grandchildren started to marry and intermarry into other tribes, and they would take on the other tribes' gods. And that's how Israel would go from, from being a great nation to all of a sudden they're in slavery. Uh, under Nebuchadnezzar or a great nation. All of a sudden they're in uh, slavery under the Philistines or whatever it is. Because what would happen is when they did not remember the law of God, it left their lips. They did not remember the greatness of God, the this, this, this parting of the Red Sea that, that left. Then their children and their children's children never even knew it happened. Does that make sense? Okay. The promises weren't lost because of the mercies of God, but each succeeding generation was unaware of the inheritance. Did you hear what I said? They were unaware of the inheritance. So if you have an inheritance, but you're unaware of it, then how will you be able to use it? So if you allow the testimony of God not to move in your house, come on. Those of you that have husbands or wives that don't come to church, okay? If you will not testify to what God is doing, 
If you're not sharing what God is doing, if you're not testifying, saying, man, he did this, he did that, we've had deaf ears open, we had uh, necks aligned, we had all these things. If you're not testifying about it, how will your children know the inheritance that awaits for them when they serve that mighty God? If you're not sharing it with your wife, if you're not sharing it with your husband, if you're not sharing what God is doing in your life, you're not testifying constantly to the goodness of what he does here in this church and among the brothers and sisters because all you have to do is come on the first Thursday and you've got a whole list of things that you can be sharing all month long. Come on. But if you're not sharing that, how will your wife, how will your uh, children, how will your husband ever come to know the Lord if they're no longer understanding, they no longer think about Him. They're busy with their own lives. They're busy with whatever they do. If you're not constantly testifying to the goodness of the Lord, then how will your children and your children's children even remember? And if they don't remember, how can they cash in? You ever had a bank account and you're sitting there trying to say, gosh, what's that number? It's your bank, it's your money, you could have a million dollars in it, but if you can't come up with a number, you can't cash it in, can you? You have to go through all this process of proving who you are. What if you had a million dollars in your bank account and you forgot that it was there? Well, that would never happen, why not? You forget about God all the time. Isn't God greater than a million dollars? So this is what happens to Israel. In fact, I remember my freshman year, 1992, at Bible college. I remember this specifically because I had to take a class called Old Testament Survey. I was a new Christian, okay? And we're doing Old Testament Survey. So we went through the Old Testament just over the books. That's what the whole semester was about. What, who wrote the book, that kind of thing. You know, the first five books, the Pentateuch, da 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 what it means, da 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 and I, at the end of the semester, I raised my hand. It was, our, it was actually our, our class sponsor. His name's a, uh, he's a pastor now, Pastor Troy Parker. Love the guy. Great guy. He's very studious. Very, very studious. And um, I said, can I ask a question? And he says, yeah. I said, why didn't God just give up on them? Because every through the whole Old Testament, he frees them. They sin. 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 They're, they're slaves here. He frees them. They're slaves. He frees them. They, they, they reject him. He frees them. I mean, over and over and over again, if you look at just the Old Testament, the Old Testament, which was the what? The Old Covenant, he constantly forgives them and brings them up. But in every instance, it was when the law left their tongue. And his acts left their thoughts. They forgot. It was stories instead of history. Sadly to say, revival looks like Old Testament Israel. History shows, ready for this, that the standard revival historically, lasts only two to four years. The revival lasts only two to four years, history shows. Many believe that it proves that revival is only meant to boost the church, kind of like a shot in the arm kind of thing, you know, that revival, that's what it's about. But I want to challenge you to think differently than what other people say. I understand what history says, but I want to challenge you. How many of you know that the kingdom of God is ever increasing and ever expanding. Right? Remember the, the, the uh, picture of Daniel, the, 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 um, the stone, the rock, Jesus, hit the feet, shattered it, said that the stone continued to grow until it took over the whole earth. The kingdom of God always is expanding. Somebody say always. So the nature of the kingdom is advancement. The nature of the kingdom is increase. The nature of the kingdom is ever expanding. So that means that God would never intend to stop an outpouring. I didn't say he wouldn't stop it. He never intended for it to stop. 
Why would God pour out his spirit and then say, okay, that's enough? Book of Acts, the upper room. There they are waiting for the promise, and the promise comes upon them. And what happened with the promise when they came back down and people were laughing at them and persecuting them and saying they're drunk, they must be this. What happened? One man stood up, preached a sermon, and 3,000 from 120 people, 3,000 gave their lives to the Lord. Does that sound like something that's supposed to end? No. No. See, the kingdom of God is ever increasing. Listen, if your walk is not increasing, then I challenge you today to kick up your heels a little bit. Come on. If, your walk, if, if you're in the same place today that you were a year ago, I challenge you to go a little deeper this year. If you're in the same place you were 10 years ago, I challenge you to go deeper. We've got to push, we've got to testify, and we've got to remember and honor everything God has done. I want to give you some true examples of revival. Somebody say true. And what I'm going to give you is documented. What I'm going to give you is true. It's not embellished in any way. And what I'm going to give you is what we're pushing for right here at Living Word Church. Okay? Got about three people. Let's start with John Wesley. Somebody say John Wesley. John Wesley. He had an anointing for the Word of God. That's what this revival was, the Word of God. Such a powerful anointing, listen to this, without speakers, without microphones, when he preached, thousands in the crowd would hear him clearly as if he was amplified. In other words, the words that were coming from his voice were so anointed that God carried them among the thousands. Oh, but it gets better. Because with John Wesley, and I want to make sure I'm reading this because I don't want to embellish the anointing was so heavy. See, when you have thousands of people out in the field, okay, and there's no speakers and no nothing, the, the, the young ones seem to want to climb a tree, right? Because they want to see, okay? They started warning people, stop climbing the trees. Because the anointing was so heavy that in the middle of the sermons, you would hear a thud, just like acorns falling from an acorn tree, as the people were falling out in the spirit and dropping to the floor. You say, well, you know, what scripture is that? Well, I remember one where Paul had to resurrect a man that fell off because he fell asleep. Hmm. Ladies, there was a lady named Maria Woodworth Etter. Just in case you know, it's not all about the men. She drew the newspapers back in the 1800s, okay? The newspapers came to her because in her meetings, listen to this, Everyone was ha would fall into a trance, and they would see heaven or they would see hell. Everybody was falling into this trance. Also, it says that people would fall out. Listen to this. This is amazing. I don't know how they, they documented this, but I wrote it down. People would fall out under the anointing of the Holy Spirit hundreds of miles away. And we're happy because we got this area right here. And we're happy because we have this area right here. See, God gave you the live stream years ago. And I believe people will get hit with the Holy Ghost through the live stream. Through the YouTube. Just hit. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about him. Just like he lets, you know, we're, we're at over 5,000 views. I was looking at it. Over 5,000 views, not only on the live stream, but on our YouTube account as well. That's pretty good for a church that's running, you know, 10 people, 12 people tonight. 5,000 views. We're coming to a point where it'll be 5,000 views a night. Because people are going to want to tune in. Cliff had that happen to him once. I'll share that later. John G. Lake. Have you ever heard of John G. Lake? So many healings in his ministry that his base of operations in Spokane, Washington was declared the healthiest city in the United States of America. See, when people find out that there's a healing anointing, those that are sick 
are going to come after it. But let me ask you a question. How do they find out there's a healing anointing flowing? By you, the church, testifying about what you saw. You know, so many times we have this false humility that we don't invite people to church. Well, it's not our building. We have a 1.30 afternoon service. But if somebody's hungry for God, they want to be in this church. And we've got to lose that false humility and say, hey, I think we've got the best thing going. And it'll get better when you join up. Amen? Does that make sense? We've got to have a little pride in living word. Amen? Now, I want to share this too. Just a few more minutes, guys. True revival is not just the local church. True revival hits all of society surrounding the church. Talking bars close, businesses close, because everybody's at church. How do they find out? By testifying what's going on. Amen. I was talking to Ray, uh, I'll share this real quick. He was talking about the time that, that in its 1990s where God hit his church, his home church. This is what he was telling me. I don't know if I've ever shared the whole thing. God hit the pulpit, split it in half. One part fell forward, one part fell this way, and the pastor flew back to the choir. Okay? Everybody's just slain in the spirit. Bam. People in the parking lot are laid out by their cars or laid out in their cars. People that don't even come to that church, this is all happening, people that don't even come to that church start driving into the church. They have no reason why. They take one step out of their car and they're laid out on the ground. The schools started to come to the church to see what was happening because the kids were carrying it to the school. And as they walked into class, people were laying out as they walked down the aisle to sit in their chair. That, my friends, is revival. It's not a Holy Ghost feel good. It is a transformation that affects not only those that come to church, but everywhere we go. I mean, can you imagine walking into a restaurant and the waitress can't serve you because she's hit with the Holy Ghost? You have to catch her glasses before she drops. Can you imagine? That's revival. How does that happen? By testifying what God is doing. Where? Everywhere. All the time. Is he good all the time? Yes. So why aren't we testifying all the time of what God is doing? Why aren't we saying, you know what? I am being transformed at Living Word Church because my identity, he's been preaching on identity for months and I'm looking at things completely different. I realize that I'm not some poor little Christian. I'm a son or a daughter of the Most High God. See, that's where that passion comes in. What incredible testimonies of God's power. I mean, I purposely grabbed old like that because it's amazing that a man will go up there and preach to tens of thousands without a speaker, without a microphone, okay? And they hear him clearly all the way to the back. You understand what that means? That means when this man spoke, the voice of the Lord spoke through him. And God was able to meet the people that we would not be able to meet without that anointing. Amazing. Amazing. Here's the question. Where are they now? Why did they decline? The kingdom's ever expanding, right? It's ever growing. Why did they decline? If the kingdom's ever increasing, I'm going to give you two reasons. Number one, the children of the revival may have recognized, maybe applauded even the miracles, but listen to what I'm about to say. The inheritance, right? They were unwilling to endure the ridicule and the persecution that their fathers were willing to endure. 
That's why. That's one reason. In other words, you, 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 let's say revival breaks out today, okay? Revival just breaks out today. And, and, and what happens is, is that, uh, let's say, and, and again, I've never put any pressure on Jonathan. That he has to be the next pastor or anything. He's got to follow God's call. But let's say this breaks out in revival and church looks nothing like it, it, it does right now. We broke out in revival. There are tens of thousands of people. Society's being changed, everything. And my time is over and I'm gone, okay? And my, I tell my son, look, do whatever you got to do. Keep this going. His job doesn't have to be apostle, doesn't have to be senior pastor. His job as a son is to steward the outpouring because he needs it to continue to go because that's his inheritance. In other words, having church is not his inheritance. Being in the middle of revival, that is his inheritance. Are you hearing me, church? His job is to steward that. Whether it's to find the right person to be in charge, whether it's to steward it. Let me tell you something. When, when Ray said when they were in, in revival, it wasn't anybody coming up and having a singing or preaching. Or, people came to church and they laid on their faces. He, in fact, he tells me he remembers standing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, laying right next to Pastor Hurd or Apostle Hurd, which is the senior pastor, and weeping and saying, I don't even know why I come to church every night because all I do is cry. And the apostle kind of looked at him and said, yeah, me too. And they just kept crying like little children. I don't know. I don't know. When the spirit comes so heavily and powerfully that a man doesn't act like a man. I don't know. That sure sounds like something I want to experience. My children, my grandchildren don't inherit living word church they inherit the kingdom because the kingdom is not living word church the kingdom is the kings amen, amen. the other reason now the, the children of revival may have recognized it may have even applauded it and say man service is awesome but they weren't willing to endure the ridicule and the persecution that comes with it and here it is ready they fail, number two, they fail to understand the principle of inheritance and the nature of the kingdom. So this is what happens. The revival starts to build monuments to remember the revival before the revival even ends. What are you saying? You're expecting it to end. That's, I, I mean... <laughs> What do we say inheritance is? Listen, I've just, just a couple more minutes, guys. Inheritance is to take in what has been given to you from your father, okay, from your mother, and to take it to give you a head start, right? And then it's your job to build and multiply it for your children and your children's children, okay? Everybody got that, right? So if revival comes into this place, and we're in revival for 10, 15, 20 years, it's time for me to go. I go on into glory. Jonathan and Ariel, they're sitting there and like, what are we supposed to do? The inheritance is for them to continue in that revival because if we've been in revival for 20 years I should leave them an inheritance that's so much that they can't contain because it's pressed down shaken together and overflowing and with that with that extra what they do is they sit there and say well, okay how do we steward this how do we spend the inheritance I'm not just talking money I'm talking prayer I'm talking time I'm talking all the, the 10 11 years that we've been you know as a church struggling and trying to get our own place I'm talking about all that they don't have to do that because they've grabbed hold of the inheritance and now they're putting it in the place where not only are they able to keep stewarding the revival, but now they're able to multiply for their children and their children's children. And how do we do that? By testifying constantly of what God is doing. How do you take on to yourselves and multiply the inheritance, you take ownership of it, and you build on it, you testify to his wonderful works, and you expect him to do it again. That's how you take on the inheritance. 
You take on the inheritance, you, you get it, and you take ownership of it. This is mine. This was my father's. Now this is mine. And I'm not going to squander it. I'm not going to go eat pig slop like the prodigal son. I'm going to invest it back into the kingdom, and I'm going to get the other part, and I'm going to multiply that, that my children would have the head start that is even greater than the one my father and mother left me. Do you see how that's royalty? We fight over pocket knives and watches when people die. That's not royalty. Come on. That's not royalty. You're a son. You're a daughter. Stand up to your feet. You're a son and you're a daughter of the Most High God. You don't fight over pocket watches. You don't fight over knives. You don't, you don't fight over somebody's picture or any of those things. You're royalty. You're the son. You're the daughter of the Most High God. You're, you're one that will draw into yourself the inheritance and you will carry the inheritance because how many of you know the inheritance is the kingdom? It's not those things that will fall away and burn. It's the kingdom. You're a kingdom dweller that is a kingdom carrier. And when you understand who you are in Christ, when you understand that everywhere you go, everywhere you go, you carry the King of kings and the Lord of lords with you. When you understand that everywhere you go, your inheritance goes with you then you'll walk like a son. You'll walk like a daughter. You'll walk the way God has called you to walk, a carrier of his light. Healing in your hands, deliverance on your tongue. Walking into the darkest of places, not looking for the light in the room, understanding that the light is already within you. That is your inheritance, church. The light is already within you. It, it doesn't matter what you've done wrong. It doesn't matter you know, how long you've been a Christian. It's not about that. His grace is renewed every morning. If you walked in the light that is inside of you, if you would pull back the drapes and let him be seen and no longer be in the world but not of it, where they didn't invite you to the bar afterwards. They don't invite you to the dirty jokes. They don't invite you to any of those things because they know you're going to put a damper on it. Why? Because you're the light in the midst of the darkness. I don't know about you, but I want my inheritance. Anybody want your inheritance tonight? I want my inheritance. I, I want my inheritance that he's already given to me to be exposed for the world to see. You know, I, I think it was William Branham. I may be wrong. It was a revivalist in the Azusa Street. Okay? The preacher. God, I'm going to hope you don't tell me to do it. In every worship service, he put a box on his head. cardboard box, puts it on his head, sits down the entire worship service, does not take it off until it's time to preach. Now, how many of you know that's weird? That's just weird. I mean, that's, you're sitting there and say, what, a cardboard box? Well, what kind of cardboard box? I don't know what kind of cardboard box it was, but it was a cardboard box, and he got it, and he put it over his head, and he wouldn't say hello to anybody. He wouldn't say nothing to nobody. He sat there in his seat the whole time during worship, and when he was time for him to preach, he'd come up, he'd take the box off, he'd come up, and he'd preach, and God would just move on that place, and God would just, just totally transform people. In the middle of the sermon, they'd come up and say, I want to get saved. I, I, I've got to get saved. I mean, just incredible things. And we sit there and say, God, are you willing? The question is, are you willing to wear the box? Can you imagine? What was that old comedian? He wore a paper bag over his head. The unknown comic. There you go. He sat there and he, had, he cut the little holes and had his little, and he was happy and laughing and everything else. And people would say, who's this guy? Well, this is what, what this man did. He, he sat there with a box on his head. Do you want to know when the Azusa Street Revival ended? Documented fact. 
when you stop wearing the box. It's when things started to fizzle out. What does that mean? That means he no longer was following the Spirit of God. Let me tell you something, and I'll finish with this. The Spirit of God will ask you to do the most inopportune things at the most inopportune time, and he doesn't care if you're embarrassed or not because he hung naked before his mother and everybody else. There was no loincloth on him. He'll ask you when you don't have time to make time. He'll ask you when you're running late to be later. He'll ask you when you've got plans to cancel the plans. He'll ask you to wear a box before you preach. Say, I'm not a preacher. Don't tell God who you are. He'll tell you who you are. I don't believe that preachers will all be those of us that are already behind the pulpit. I believe people will want to experience God through those that allow God to move through them. Just like we have the prophetic team that's up here that does what they do. Everybody's just like, wow, wow, wow. People, they don't, it doesn't have to be the one in charge. It has to be him in charge. Amen. You want your inheritance tonight? Would you close your eyes? Would you tell them, I want my inheritance? Just tell them. Because you actually already have it. So really what you should be saying is, I want my inheritance to show. Father God, would you open our eyes that we would see our inheritance? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Open our eyes, God. Show us you and our inheritance. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Beloved, If you would let the kingdom of God be seen in your daily lives through your testimony, through your constantly speaking about him, constantly being aware and exercising the gifts that are within you, this building could not contain a prayer service, let alone a worship service. Because all these chairs, all this altar would be filled with people seeking God. But you, you are the ones that draw them in. Because at the end of the day, it's not the Ustream, it's not the YouTube, it's not the website, it's not the Facebook. It is the Spirit of God moving through you that will take them to a higher place. So I pray that you answer the call. Wherever you are throughout the day, that you would not only pray for your brothers and sisters in church, but you would pray for the new brothers and sisters that are coming very soon. Expect the chairs to be filled. Expect the building to come into play now, not later, because we're calling our tomorrow into our today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget prophetic school tomorrow. I tell you what, if you're here tonight, that means there's revival within you. Steward it. Steward it. Let it out. Because it takes one torch to light up the whole building. And there's more than one torch here. Amen.
You have something you got to say? God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we will meet. Yeah, there will be over here. Those of them that are going to practice, and we're over there. <laughs>